Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Data and Science Podcast. Today, we have a returning guest, Professor Jingyi Jessica Lee from UCLA. And what we're going to be talking about is advancing genomics through rigorous statistics or advancing the statistical rigor of genomics. So, Jessica, welcome back to the show. Um, Thank you, Glenn. Happy yes. to be back. Yes. Yeah, so how, how should we begin? Um, I, I used to know things about genomics. Now I don't know things about genomics. So yeah, maybe maybe we could just start gently just so that anyone who isn't as familiar with the field can just sort of go into this before we can latch onto those sort of statistical commonalities that we all know about. Sure. I think the biggest advancement in genomics was happened in around 2005 to 2007 when the next generation sequencing technology become became mature. So in other words, we are, we are able to use sequencing to measure a lot of biochemical properties from our DNA, RNA as a whole. So since the multiple assays have been developed, including what we call the RNA sequencing, which directly measures all RNA molecules in a, in a biological sample, also, it also includes, say, ChIP-seq, which measures where do a certain protein bind to the DNA on the genome-wide scale. And also we have, say, methylseq, which measures the DNA methylation sites on a genome-wide manner. So these are just examples. And of course, we have the whole genome sequencing, which directly sequences the DNA sequences itself. So we can tell how different my genome is from your genome. So we can measure genome on an individual basis. So these technologies give us a lot more data we can analyze. And they also allow us to probe into the data without a predefined hypothesis. So we can generate new hypotheses from these massive data. Cool. So, um, yeah, yeah I, I think, so basically part of the idea here is that we have so much data now exactly. that we don't yeah. actually need to be going in with initial hypotheses or anything. And right. I think that this gets back to sort of a pretty common theme that a lot of us have been talking about where it's like, we really like this hypothesis driven science and, but we still don't want to throw out the massive amount of data that we have. So we have this balancing act between, yep. um, ensuring that we have hypotheses, uh, hypotheses, particularly around the actual physical or biological mechanism yep. for these, uh, relationships. And, but we also have a ton of data and where there's data, um, people tend to adventure. So, um, what, what would be uh, an example of, um, something where people are essentially venturing out without a hypothesis? Um, and then what, what is sort of the problem with that? All right. So may, let me give an example using ChIP-seq. So as I said, it measures, uh, the binding sites of an important protein. So, so that, that's what ChIP-seq does. So ChIP-seq yeah. is, uh, is a method by which you are measuring the binding sites right. of different, of two a proteins of particular, or, a particular a, protein. Usually a particular protein because you need to design some specific antibodies that only bind to that protein to carry out this experiment. And usually that protein is something we know is very important. Like we call that a transcription factor, that's the type of proteins which activate gene expression. So okay. there are many of them, and their combination will activate different sets of genes. So that will give us this biological diversity we see in different tissues, because we have different sets of genes expressed in different tissues. So, so ChIP-seq is a way for us to know, oh, where do an important, where does an important protein bind to? And so to answer that question, we will obtain the ChIP-seq data. The raw data are actually sequences of protein binding sites, actually fragments of protein binding site sequences. And given that, we are going to, the first step is to map those fragments, which we call, call as reads, back to the genome. We have the human reference genome. So we know the whole genome sequence, right? And then we can align each ChIP-seq read back to the genome. And with that, we can tell, okay, the mapping, the mapped reads will give us some information about protein binding. But we have to bear in mind that there are a lot of noises in the data. So for example, if we just have one read mapped to a site, then it is unlikely that 
that side is a protein binding site. So we will rely on the mapped reed density. In other words, if we see a region where many reeds are mapped there, there compared to the adjacent sites, then we want to call that site a binding site. So this becomes a computational task. How do you find protein binding sites or how do you infer protein binding sites from ChIP-seq peak data? And also to capture that noise level, usually people would generate a control ChIP-seq sample where no pro, where I would say no antibodies are added. So in other words, we know if we measure something about the protein binding there, that should come from just background noise, not, not really the protein binding. So with that, we can actually generate a negative control. Another way is we just in, use some input DNA where there's no protein and we still carry out experiment. So we know that anything measured from the input DNA sample is purely background noise. So then with this setting, you will have two samples, one from the actual biological sample you want to measure, the other from a negative control where no protein binding sites are expected. Then because they're from the same human genome, you will have a direct comparison for each genomic region, right? You For the same region, you're going to have a read count from the experimental sample and another recount from the negative control sample. And you want to compare the two counts. So you want to set a cutoff, basically. How large should the experimental count be? Or how large the difference should the two counts be so that you want to call this region a binding site in the experimental sample? So this is a statistical question. Hey everyone, we're now a few minutes into the episode. This is usually the part where a podcaster mentions a sponsor or talks about their Patreon page. I'm not going to do that, but I will ask two things of you. One, if you could leave a like, and two, if you could leave a comment. You see, podcasting platforms are basically just giant search engines, and people interacting with the videos by leaving comments is the main way that channels survive and grow. So I'm asking you to leave a comment. If you don't quite know what to say, well, just give me an idea for a future topic that you like considered for a future video. That's it. Back to the show. Yeah. That, that is interesting, and I do like how effectively we are coming back to some fairly sort of, again, not just hypothesis, speaking more generally from general scientific hypotheses, but, you know, we're getting very much into statistical hypothesis testing territory, where effectively we are creating, I guess, from a reasoning perspective, we're creating these counterfactuals, yeah. um, or, and from which we can then deduce what the effect is, which is pretty exciting. So what what what, what could possibly go wrong then? Uh, so and a common issue I have seen in seen in the popular software by informatics software is that they inform, they formulated this problem as a hypothesis testing problem, but their formulation seems to be, or I would say they, they did, they actually only considered the experimental sample as a random observation. So basically I said each region will have a count from experimental sample and the count from the negative control sample, right? So we have two counts. And if you think about it, both counts should be regarded as two random observations in our statistical sense, right? But what they actually Sorry, did- Can you actually, can you uh, re-clarify that point? So they should both be considered two random observations, one from- One from each, ex- each from a different condition, yeah. each from a different distribution, right? And what we really want to say is that the two distributions are different. Right, that's what we want to do for statistical inference. But in those softwares, in their formulation, although they said, okay, we're calculating a p-value, but if you read into it carefully, you can see that they actually ignore the fact that the negative control count is also a random observation. It's not the true parameter of the background control distribution. So they've made a parametric assumption for each count. They assume each count comes from a Poisson distribution with its own mean parameter. And they want to test whether for the experimental count, it's coming from a Poisson parameter that equals the background count 
or it is greater than the background count. So that's their two hypotheses. One, the null hypothesis is that the experimental Poisson mean equals the background count. The alternative hypothesis is the uh, experimental Poisson mean is greater than the background count. So they are just using the observed experimental count to test these two hypotheses and see whether they want to go for the alternative or stay as the null. So you see the problem here is that the experimental count itself was just used as the parameter as the, the parameter they want to test for, but it, they, they just didn't think about it as a random variable, random observation. That is interesting. Yeah, yeah. so um, just to paraphrase this, we have effectively, you have um, this data and it is looking, it's, there are of course, they, they are two observations essentially because you, you've run an experiment. We have a baseline, we have a baseline count. Um, and so that is effectively the counterfactual um, yeah. But we have a baseline count, and instead of treating that baseline count as if it's one draw from this, you know, counterfactual distribution or this null distribution, um, you're actually treating it as if it is the distribution, like it, it that its results actually are what properly summarize this distribution and this variability to the full extent. So you're saying yeah. that basically it's like you take the number of observations, and that's enough to say it's like, oh, this is from a uh, th this is the uh, lambda value for the Poisson distribution, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And so obviously, so is the only issue there that we're undercounting or under considering the variability of the null distribution or is there more, more to it as well? I would say, so, so basically given what they did, right, they just completely just dropped the randomness of one sample, but just treating the other sample as the only sample. I think an issue with this is that mm, the p-values become quite unpredictable about their behavior, right? We know that the p-values must follow a general rule to be valid. That is, if the null hypothesis holds, right, the p-values should be uniformly distributed between 0 and 1. That's what a valid p-value should behave like. But Given this formulation, actually, at least based on our findings, because under the assumption that the majority of the regions we examined using this approach are not really from the not re really from the alternative, right? They are from the null because that's the general assumption of genomics analysis. That is, the interesting parts, the interesting regions are the are just the minority, and the majority are uninteresting. So given that, we should expect that looking at the p-value distribution of, of all regions based on this analysis, we should expect that the majority of them should be uniformly between 0 and 1. But that's not something we saw. So, so I would say that the, probably this analysis, by ignoring the uncertainty from the background sample, the, the effect will be that, the consequence will be that the p-values tend to be smaller than they should be. So in other words, we are, try, we are really um, exaggerating the findings. And I think the, the authors of those software papers also realize that because they have too many p-values that are way too small. So in their menus, usually the p-value cutoff, right? So we have, this is a very big multiple testing problem. We test so many regions at a time, and we need to set a cutoff that satisfies the false discovery rate control. That's a common criteria used in the field. But in that case, they realize that if they directly use the p-values as p-values and apply a general FDR control procedure on p-values, say the Benjamini Hochberg procedure or Hochberg procedure, then the resulting p-value threshold is not small enough so that they will still have so many regions to be caught as peak or binding sites. So in this case, they think, okay, probably the p-values here do not work that well. So they have found other ways to control the FDR. So to my knowledge, one is that they try to, they have actually invented a very small way for doing that. So that is they just revert or, or they actually, yeah, they not revert, I should say, they just invert the two samples 
pretend that the experimental sample is the background and the background sample is the experimental sample and they do the same analysis so they know that in this way any peaks caught from the fake experimental sample are false are false so that that can give us a the an estimate for the number of false discoveries, right? Let's say I apply the p-value threshold 10 to the minus 6 to both analysis, the normal one and this artificial one, then we can have two numbers, right? One, the, the numbers of called peaks from each setting, and then I can get a ratio, right? The ratio is the number of called peaks from this fake sample divided by the number of called peaks from the actual sample. And then we can actually calculate a ratio, and they, they just use this as a, I will say, approximate false discovery rate and control this to, say, 5%. So this way allows, us, allow, allows them to adjust the p-value threshold. And they found that this p-value threshold is usually a lot smaller than the p-value threshold from the benjamin Hopper procedure if you just treat p-values as p-values. And another common analysis, another common way in analysis is that people just totally ignored the FDR threshold. They just want to set a small enough p-value threshold so that they don't get too many peaks. And usually that number is based on their knowledge, like what number is considered to be normal or just considered to be something that's acceptable. So that's what how people usually do. So you can see from the the, the actual practices that people don't take p-values that seriously in this field. They just need p-values as an intermediate measure where they can set a cutoff and move on to their next step. Cool. So as you're talking about the first sort of solution that they did where they were essentially interchanging the experimental and the control observations it sort of reminded me a little bit of like a permutation test that people do. Right, um, right, right. Is, is, so is that an actual, is that a correct uh, association mm, to make? Not, not really, because okay. in permutation, you know, what you did is that you there's some random shuffling, right? You want to make sure that ap after permutation, the sample essentially come from the null hypothesis. That's what you did from the permutation. But in their case, not exactly. It's more like you just take the control as experimental, experiment as control. You just reverse their relationship. And in that, in this case, and I think the reason they can do it is simply because the test they're looking at is one-sided. They're only interested in the cases where the experimental observation is much larger than the background observation, but not vice versa. But so therefore, once they do the the reverse, right, the inversion, they will no longer, they expect no more experiment and no more that the new experimental sample to be greater than the new background sample. However, if you still think about it, this doesn't completely resolve the problem because why is that? The reason is that the way they calculate the FDR is only based on still one observation of the case where you have false discoveries, right? And we know that the false discovery is an expectation, an expected ratio. An expectation is taking over the data distribution. But obviously by doing this one time sample swapping, we are not taking an expectation. So, so that's why I think, yeah, this is a practical solution, definitely better than just using the benjamin hochberg procedure on the p-values directly, given the p-values are problematic, but it does not completely solve the statistical problem. What about um, when you said that one thing that people do is they also just sort of lose, they stop really listening to p-values or they lose faith in that the p-value is saying what it is meant to say, which in some part just sounds like a lot of uh, science where effectively, you know, given that we know how much p-value hacking goes on and things like that, we might not believe p-values across most fields anyway. Um, right. But so I guess sort of what would what would stop the scientists from just saying, okay, we don't really believe these p-values and it's more like a relative ranking and we'll just make some type of non-statistical decision from there. 
Mm, that's totally okay. If you just drop statistics totally, you'd make your analysis transparent and stay how you set a threshold, right? You just make it honest. But on the other hand, I don't think the people in, in genomics, at least, they want to drop p-values. They actually, they are very persistent in keeping the p-values to make their pipeline look statistical. So it's, it becomes like a selling point for their paper to get published. So that's the ir irony. On the one hand, they don't take p-values seriously. On the other hand, they try to use p-values to package their method. That is, that is a, that is a funny thing. And it's, uh, yeah. it reminds me of many things in science where effectively the moment you find that science will, science is of course, like, I think one of the greatest tools that intellectual tools that humanity has come up with and is an excellent way to be learning about our world. But the moment that people realize, oh, if we package something with a scientific label or in once you're scientific, if we can package something in a statistical label that it seems like it's more valid that people will do the minimum that they need to to be able to package something in a statistical label, regardless of whether or not it's actually fundamentally statistically sound. Um, right. <laughs> and so it becomes more of like an advertisement, like um, yep. like Pepsi on a NASCAR uh, <laughs> car or something like that, where, yeah, it's like pe people try to, they know that they either, one, for publication purposes, need to surpass the statistical hurdle, so then they engage in shenanigans to overcome that, for example, the like p value at 0.05 cutoff, where that will determine whether something can get published, regardless of the scientific merit of the experiment or things like that. Um, and then this, what you're talking about, but yeah, go on. Uh, just I'll, I'll let the story go where you think it should go. But this is very interesting. Yeah, yeah, I think it it is, and also this issue is has hasn't been talked that much in this in the past p value debate. I, I saw from the p-value debate that people mostly talk about one particular test and one p-value, whether that p-value actually reflects the scientific discovery you want to look for. But here we have thousands or tens of thousands of hypotheses ongoing and also tens of thousands of p-values being generated. So in this more common, I would say, multiple testing scenario in the genomics applications, I think it has been left out in the p-value debate conducted by ASA. And yeah, so actually, and also this is not really about whether a pro, an appropriate test was chosen, right? I think in p-value debate, usually people are saying there are multiple ways to do the test and they give us different p-values. But um, in that case, I can see that those p-values are all valid. It's just that they they reflect different, they may correspond to different alternative hypotheses, then there's some power differences. Some may be more powerful, some may be less, right? But that depends on the test we choose. Whether you go for t-test or you go for Wilcoxon rank sum test, those two will give you two different p-values. But in the story I just talked about, I think it's more fundamental. It's about the whether the test itself is actually valid. You don't actually get valid p-values, but still you are relying on them to make decisions. That and these examples are, I have to add one more sentence that this scenario, although I was talking about chip seek data, but I have seen it in other cases, other applications as well. So same flavor, just different applications. Yeah. That is interesting. Can you go back a little bit when you're saying that, uh, that they might actually be looking at a different, you say they either might have been looking at different, a different, they might be rejecting the wrong null hypothesis. Is that what you said? Or is that that they might be uh, evaluating well, an alternative? It, actually, alternative. I think in the, in the story I was talking about, I think their null hypothesis is just not meaningful. Okay. Think about it. You're testing the lambda, the Poisson lambda being equal to the background observation. But the background observation per se is not interesting, right? It's just a random random observation. Let's say the background may have a distribution as Poisson with parameter one. Then you may observe a zero. You may observe one. You may observe two. But in those three different cases, using their approach, the null hypothesis will be different. Sometimes you're testing lambda equals zero. Sometimes lambda equals one. So to me, that itself is not a valid test. Yeah. That, that that is an interesting point. Yeah, that's yeah. That, 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 that's a cool thing, and that's why that's why it's nice to uh, just have these conversations, um, just for something to think about. Yeah. 
Um, <laughs> I guess at some point, well, uh, should we talk about some of the solutions that you wanted to discuss, or would you prefer that we go over other uh, unstatistical, subpar statistical solutions? Um, so I want to use this opportunity to promote our work, which is a new framework, right? We call it Clipper, and the major advantage I see in it is that we can get rid of p-values or the p-value calculation as a necessary step for FDR control. So in the genomics data analysis setting, since we have thousands or tens of thousands of features, right? In the previous example, a region is a feature. We want to just try to find among those many features what 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 which ones are the interesting ones, right? And the interesting could be that there are observations or measurements are higher in the experimental condition than the background condition. Or it could be that their measurements are different between the experimental condition and background condition. So either way, we call them enrichment analysis and differential analysis. We can actually find a way to directly control the FDR without resorting to p-values. And how we achieve that is to, we still need something very similar to the test statistics we, we need to calculate, one per feature. And in our case, we call that statistic as a contrast score. So the contrast score will reflect the degree to which a feature might be interesting. So, so the requirement for a valid contrast score, we have detailed it in our paper, but the general idea is that if the feature is uninteresting, which means that there's no interesting difference between the two conditions, what the feature's contrast score should be approximately, I would say, yeah, it should be a symmetric around zero. It will be positive or negative to the same degree. So in other words, if we look at the contrast scores of all the tens of thousands of features together, we would expect to see a distribution concentrated around zero and being symmetric. On the other hand, for the interesting features, we want their contrast scores to be largely positive. So that will give us distribution with a very skewed right tail, but on the left part, it's symmetric around zero. So people can visually check whether the contrast scores calculated on their data satisfy this property. If so, then can, they can move on to our next step for thresholding the contrast scores. And the thresholding step is actually based on a statistical paper and it was actually the motivation of our study. It's called the knockoffs technology. And we borrowed the knockoffs technique. We borrowed their thresholding step for achieving the FDR control. So with that, you, will, you are going to have a positive threshold on your contrast scores. And all the features whose contrast scores are greater or equal than that threshold will be called discoveries. So that's it. So you can see that there's no p-value involved. And also, the key difference between the current practice and what we are doing here is that we just directly go from the statistics to a cutoff. We don't go through the p-value conversion step and then controlling FDR on the p-values. We, we think that's unnecessary. And also, that step alone can introduce more issues, right? Because if you do not convert statistic into p-values in a correct way, then the p-values become invalid, and then thresholding based on the Benjamini Hodgeberg will be not useful. That is very cool. What yeah. would be some of sort of the uh, the challenges or like, I guess, shortcomings of this method? What what were, be, yeah, what would be some of the main challenges to using this method? That's our ongoing work. So don't, but I don't think that's a particular or unique challenge just to, for us. The, the challenges also applies to statistical test. So you need to choose a test statistic. And like in our case, you need to choose a, a contrast score. So it's the same like similar choice problem, right? You have multiple choices that can satisfy the property we desire for a valid contrast score, just like in the testing. You have multiple test statistics to answer the same question. Which one would you choose? And so in this case, it becomes a power comparison problem. You want to choose a more powerful statistic, or in our case, a more powerful contrast score. But we know that theoretical understanding into this, once your test is not a simple, um, simple 
hypothesis, right? Like the now is some parameter equals something, alternative some parameter equals something. In that case, we know we have the Neyman Pearson lemma to give us a most powerful test. But usually the test is not that simple. The, the alternative hypothesis is usually composite. It's an inequality. So in this case, which one is more powerful? We look into this literature, but it's very, I don't think it's possible to have a clear cut situation for every scenario. So I think for that, we need to give people some clear guidelines in practice, like for which analysis based on our empirical study, which contrast score we will pick. Yeah, that's, that's, that's just the remaining work. Yeah, that's really cool. I also like the idea of um, not when in the cases where there's no sort of like clear cut objective way by which to pursue some type of scientific inference that um, one people just acknowledge it. It's like, there's no clear cut way. There's some sort of subjective decision-making yeah. process and you can follow some guidelines um, that will have maybe fewer problems or at least a well-defined set of problems uh, that you know about. What are some of the types of guidelines that you're suggesting? So like, what is a basic uh, decision or uh, aspect that people should really focus on? So we think the sample size is definitely a factor, right? So we're still playing with how different contrast scores may have different power advantages with different sample sizes. So like the in the story I presented to you, it's a one versus one sample size. In each condition, we only have one sample. But with the sample size sizes go go up, right? What can we do? And also we have to I have to be I have to say that our framework is especially useful for small sample sizes because we know if sample sizes go up, say more than more than 20, we could use those non-parametric tests, which are quite safe to give us p-value p-values because they make no parametric assumptions about the data. So you don't need to worry that their assumptions do not fit to data. So that's actually the second thing I want to talk about. So people just use parametric models when they don't need to in genomic data analysis. Yeah. And that's actually just because of, you know, many people follow the routine and the popularity of methods when they analyze their data. However, they ignore the fact that when these methods became popular in the old days, the, the sample sizes were much smaller. Now you have a much bigger sample size. You don't need to use the parametric methods that were popular. You could actually use a simple non-parametric method. Yeah. What? Um. Cool. So, where where would you like to go from there? Just because um at, at this point you're definitely leading the conversation. So what, yeah. What what was so the the next sort of key thought on that? So the key, so so the, as I said, so that's why when I when we try to optimize our framework, we concentrate on the small sample size problem because we have observed that. So because our method itself is non-parametric, by the way. So we observe that once the sample sizes go up, our approach will converge to the non-parametric tests, which can give you accurate p-values in that case. Yeah. So this actually allows me to naturally migrate to the second topic, right? Regarding the parametric models widely used in genomics data analysis. So I have to say that this problem is, I don't call it a problem. I think using parametric models was an inevitable solution people need when your sample sizes were so small in the old days. So for example, people would assume that their sequencing count follow Poisson distribution or negative binomial distribution, a two, co two common distributions for count data. People just follow that. And when you say only have a sample of size three, that means you only have three observations. There's basically no way for you to check whether Poisson distribution holds or negative binomial distribution holds, right? You just don't have enough data. So in this case, making the assumption that you think is reasonable, I think that's the only way to go. But now we have more data. And also I have to say the settings are different. Usually when you have three sample sizes of three, it was a an in-lab experiment where you measure your biological sample for three times, right? We know since an experiment is expensive, sequencing experiment is expensive, a lab cannot afford to do many repetitions on the same sample. So size three is common. But now in a lot of population level studies, they measure individuals 
RNA seq data, let's say, or some other data. So in that case, the sample size is usually at least hundreds. So because we want to collect more data from more individuals, and the goal is to capture the heterogeneity among individuals. So in this case, should we still use the methods developed for the sample size three data? I, I think people didn't realize that those methods, though being very popular, they are not designed for population level data. So they need to check whether those, data, those methods are still valid, but they don't. They just follow the tradition, they apply the method and do the analysis. So what motivated me to realize this issue is that a collaborator of mine found that after permutation, so the story you mentioned, after permuting, let's say we have individuals with immune therapy and without immune their immunotherapy. So for those two groups of patients, we swapped them, we permuted them. So basically there are no more differences in the, perm in the two permuted groups. Then my collaborator applies those popular methods for finding differentially expressed genes to the permitted data. And surprisingly, we find a good number of differential expressions. So that doesn't make sense for sure, because we shouldn't expect any differential expressions. If there are some, they might be due to randomness. However, the number we got were was far more or far larger than the random number. So therefore, this motivated us to look into why these popular methods give us so many likely false positives, right? And then we found that the, the fundamental reason is the parametric distribution, the negative binomial distribution. They assume in the method don't fit well to the data. So the data, if you look at the for one gene, you look at its counts in different individuals. You pull those counts together to draw a distribution. And then the distribution looks far different from the negative binomial distribution. So in other words, we just have to conclude that the negative binomial distribution may apply to experimental replicates, or at least that's our assumption, right? Given three replicates, there's no way to verify it. But definitely it's not applied applicable to population level data. Yeah. So, but, but given that we have hundreds of people in each group, we could apply the non-parametric Wilcoxon test. So yeah, that's a simple solution. But people, you know, in this field, they tend to forget or not, they tend to follow the pipeline using those popular, specifically designed bioinformatics methods, but not the textbook statistical methods we learn. Hey everyone, we're now in the final stretch of this interview. If you haven't yet left a like or a comment, I'd really appreciate it if you did. If you already have left a comment, just leave a second comment. Maybe talk about what you're uh, studying or what you're working on or your field. I really like to know more about our audience, especially the wide variety of scientists that we have listening to the show. That's it, and enjoy the rest of the episode. And, and so the third part of the pipeline, which was the inferred covariates bit, could you talk about that? Yeah, of course. So the inferred covariates means that the covariate you're interested in it's not observable. You don't have data directly collected for that covariate. Instead, you inferred it from the data, the same data set you are going to use for association analysis with or between your outcome and the inferred covariates. So in the regression setting, if we think about it, it's that, or maybe I should be more specific in the example of doing this so-called gene expression association with a cell pseudotype. So this is a very typical analysis in single cell um, RNA sequencing data analysis. So what it means is that in our data, the data, the cells are not ordered. So you don't actually have a time covariate observed for each cell. Instead, you try to infer what we call pseudo time is the relative order of the cell of one cell among all cells. So in other words, say you have n cells, you will sort them between one and n in some way. So the idea is that you want to put cells with similar gene expression profiles together in the ordering. And you also want this order to reflect some sort of biological process such as cell differentiation or immune response. 
So assuming that you're able to do that, then after this pseudo time inference step, you will be able to give every cell a pseudo time. And that's a value. If you do use the normalized pseudo time that's commonly used, it's between zero and one. So the cell placed to be the first will have a pseudo time value close to zero. And the cell to be placed the last will have a pseudo time value close to one. Just to pick into this a little bit um, for the pseudo time selection so I understand it better, uh, can you just go over again how you might are there sorry are there multiple strategies to yeah, select multiple suit? strategies and yeah. so what is uh, is there one that's most popular or is it just uh, free for all um and decide which one I would say new more so in this field the most popular one probably in my mind is the one that's more recent so that method is actually developed for it's actually a very simple strategy compared to some of the old ones but they all share a commonality that is they use the algorithm called minimum spanning tree to actually find a trajectory tree-like structure to describe all cells so this new software called slingshot and what it does is that first of all it will try to do pca on all cells so it will obtain the first two PCs and a two-dimensional scatter plot of cells in the two PCs. And then what it does is that it will try to fit a minimum spanning tree to connect the cells of the in the PC space. And with that, they try to further smooth out the tree structure by doing principal curve in the two PCs. So that is a smooth version of the tree. And then, so every cell, we can assign it to the path or the principal curve that's closest to the cell and the projection, the vertical projection of the cell to the principal curve will give us a coordinate of the cell in the curve. And we keep that coordinate, call that pseudo time. So in other words, let's say you're, you have fed two principal curves to the cells, then you are going to have two trajectories. And the pseudo time is a concept within each trajectory. So okay. it just tells you what the relative position the cell has in that trajectory. All right. And yeah. just one other little question. Uh, why, why, why select two? You said the first two PCs, why? Um... It's, I think it's for visualization. So okay. People want to look at it. But, fair enough. but, but fair, yeah, but, and also I, I, I assume that's primarily the reason. Yeah. Some also, another software, Monaco, it's version three, Monaco three. And Monaco is the first method that proposed the pseudo time idea, maybe back in 2014, 15. And so this version three, doesn't use PC, the two PCs for the two dimensional space, but they use a popular non linear dimensional reduction method called UMAP to do the job. So you can see that after they have a UMAP two dimensional embedding for every cell, they proceed with um, the, the minimum spanning tree. Yeah. So the, I, I think back to your question. I just think it's easier to handle the two-dimensional space so you can have the trajectory represented as a curve. Imagine that you go to four dimensions, then the trajectory could be a plane, right? So, or yeah, so that makes things a little more complicated. Or if you go to three-dimensional space, the tra tra trajectory can be a plane. But for four-dimensional space, things are more difficult. You could be like a three-dimensional subspace, yeah. Cool. Sorry for that little uh, detour, but yeah, I was just curious about those things. Whenever, whenever people are describing pipelines, I always come up with questions about, you know, why precisely one thing or another. But yeah, uh, p please continue. Yeah. So let's uh, say that you have the pseudo time values for sales. Then the natural question to ask is, since you assume the pseudo time represents some sort of biological process like cell differentiation, given that and why would you need this, right? The, your ultimate goal is to study which, what genes have expression values change along the pseudo time. So if a gene has, a, has an expression that first rises and then goes down, then it may be different from a gene whose expression 
only goes up in the end of the trajectory, or a gene whose expression is the highest at the beginning of the trajectory. So those three patterns will tell you different biology. It will tell you when a gene actually participates or exerts its role. So given that, we need a way to detect the genes whose expression change along the pseudotime, right? And we want to know in what way. So this question is basically a regression type of model, can be answered by a regression type of model. Basically here, the for every gene, we're going to do, a reg do one regression with the gene expression value as the Y as the outcome, and with the seed cell seed time as the X as the feature or covariate, right? So in this case, every cell will have a value for that gene and also it has, has its pseudo time value. So that gives us the regression setting. But back to the thing, if you don't treat the cell pseudo time as inferred, you're done. This is a regression problem. But as we know, the pseudo time is not observed. And the key is that you infer the pseudo time by using the data already for once. It's the same data you infer the pseudo time, and later you're going to use it for the regression. So that's the message I'm going to emphasize here. We need to be fully aware that the covariates are inferred and we need to handle it properly. So motivated by this, my group developed a method called pseudotime DE. DE stands for differential expression. So which specifically handles this issue by using, um, you can call it permutation analysis or, but we want to basically um, distinguish what we did from the bootstrap in that we are doing basically subsampling and then permutation. The difference is that, or, or subsampling, well, with subsampling, you do the cell time, pseudo time inference, and then you permute the pseudo time to create a null. So the reason why we didn't do bootstrap is because um, some softwares for pseudo time inference do not allow for duplicate cells. So if you have a same, the same cell appear for twice, this software will give you some a warning or error message. Yeah, so that's, the, that's primarily the reason. And I also want to point out that this is very aligned with a very interesting area, rising area in statistics called selective inference. So what, what the people mean by selective inference, they're actually concerned that there's some parameter, hyperparameter in the pipeline whose selection depends on the same data you use. So I think a typical example is lasso, where when you run lasso regression, you there's a lambda parameter, the penalization parameter that must be preset, right? So you can do the optimization. But that lambda is often chosen by cross-validation. And cross-validation is based on the same data. So in other words, you use the data for twice, first to determine lambda, and then with a lambda chosen or selected, you do you fit the you run the lasso regression again. So yeah, so I think people are aware of the issue with this. If by and, and this issue is concerned the downstream inference. If you want to use lasso as the tool to talk about the confidence intervals of the lasso parameters, the coefficients. It, Etc. If you talk about the inference of parameters, then you must consider lambda to be selected instead of being fixed. And I think that's the same issue we face here. If you consider the cell covariates to be observed and fixed as we do in regression, the result is different from considering it to be random and inferred from the same data. Right, so I think there are a lot of work that can be done along this line in biology, and I'm very in enthusiastic about it. Yeah, that that is really cool, and I appreciate you know as someone who was you know working in uh, genomics uh, very early in his career, it, it's really fun to have these conversations, and also just you know whether or not people are working in this field or not, um, it is very useful to hearing a statistician like yourself think through the actual, uh, you know, you called it, talk about the biology, typically in my field, talk about like the physiology or the, uh, the mechanisms, the mechanistic understanding. So it is very, it is very nice to, uh, you know, just hear other people talk about the different, uh, the key biological mechanisms, um, 
that inform the actual methods that they're using and how they develop those things. Um, on uh, what I, I I have to ask just because I'm I'm interested. Um, what what are some of like the future sort of physiological mechanisms or biological mechanisms that you'd like to see incorporated more into genomics in the future? Um, is it um you know, yeah go on. Yeah, definitely. I think a lot of people are doing that, especially people who study diseases like neurological diseases. People realize that the physiological or phenotype measurements, such as the neuron activities, right? We can use some continuous measurements to measure or F fMRI measurements. So these are physiological and they can perform those on patients, right? And they these should be combined with molecular biology experiments like genomics. Genomics is just a sort of high throughput experiment for for molecular biology. So these should be combined, integrated, or so that they can collectively review new insights. So what I see the opportunity as um, physiological measurements can be done, can be performed on a larger group of patients, right? Because they're not disruptive. And so then we can have data from clinical doctors. And on the other hand, molecular biology experiments has, you know, are, cannot be really done on patients, right? Because they, they basically destroy yourselves. So we need to rely on cell lines or at most patients' blood samples, right? And for neurological disease, and and I will say also say mouse or mice, right? So these are our experimental tools. So how to combine them and try to reflect interesting insights? I think that definitely needs collective efforts. Yeah, yeah. I think for cancer, probably um, it's easier to study in that aspect because we will have biopsy sample from patients, right? But, but but these are only from, you know, cancer patients, not from normal patients because they will not take, give you their biopsy unless they are, they, they suspect that they have cancer. So they must do biopsy. So you may have the site, the disease site, but for a neurological disease, I think that's even more difficult because you cannot really obtain the neurons from the, from the patients. But, but yeah, I think there are many opportunities out there and the integration will definitely be a key part. Instead of having people studying different modalities of biomedical data separately, we need collective efforts. And there are a lot of statistics. I will also say WE, right? If you want to analyze those signals, physiological signals, and also I think, yeah, so computer science involved. You, uh, yeah, I, I just have to ask since you brought that up, um, within sort of the statistical genomics community or the greater genomics community, is there much of a division in the difference in the concept concepts between, for example, statisticians, data scientists, machine learning scientists, and for example, computer scientists? Um, how, how much of a difference or similar similarity is there, um, for these different sort of technical experts working in the field? Mm, that's a good question. I would say not so detailed division, I think, but, but still you can see other people may call themselves or we're doing genomics, right? But you can see some clear differences between people with a statistics background or works in the statistics department versus those who have a computer science background works in the computer science department. And furthermore, people who work in biology departments. So even though they are, they all claim we do computational biology or genomics in some way, but you can see the style differences in their work and in their focuses. So let me just put it simply. I think I'm an example of a statistical genomics person, right? So when we focus, look, look at problems, we look at the problems with a statistical nature. So for example, randomness, when, whenever randomness gets into play, I think it's the job of statisticians to make the randomness to be properly accounted for. I think for computer science people, they are more, well, I would say they are, they focus more on, or they are better at developing efficient algorithms to solve the problem. For example, I think the first pseudo time inference problem was proposed by a person with a computer science background. 
and yeah so it works very well and then it's just similar to you know, if you think about um, the algorithm in machine learning right I, I would say the tree-based algorithms also including random forest they have some computer science nature right so you can think see that it's very algorithm like and but later statisticians usually jump in to analyze the properties of these algorithms and off try to offer some statistical insights into it and i think that's the same and yeah just feel free to start um on say right. for third yep cool so the third category of people are faculty members who work in a biology department or in a medical school so their primary focus is to understand biology or disease from the molecular biology perspective so to them the genomics is just a tool experimental tool for exploration and because they want to ex extract new insights from genomics data it is very important that they are able to analyze those data right so to them the computer computational method development is just um, a necessary step to be so that they are able to analyze their data i think for their goal usually they will start with some popular tools for analyzing their data unless they find oh these tools are not satisfactory i need some new tools to specifically address my needs yes then they will develop new methods but in that case, I would say their computational method development is secondary to their biological investigation, which is very different from the first two categories, statistical type or computer science type of researchers. Because for the first two categories, the primary goal is to develop new methods. Yeah, that is, that is a really uh, useful distinction, and I'll have to uh, apologize for getting that there are always, of course, subject matter experts looking to explore their own data in their own right. Um, exactly. So, yeah, 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 my bad. Um, but yeah, yeah um, but yeah, no, th th that is cool and helpful. And um, yeah, as I guess, as you said, sort of the, the way that people conceptualize errors, it's funny that just that way that people conceptualize them is a you know a major differentiator you know where they're you're basically trying to deal with them errors is some aspect of a cost function or versus um for us statisticians who we tend to view errors as um aspects of variability according to some distribution um yeah, yeah exactly you, yeah and also i think you mentioned the machine learning i would say machine learning you can see the term appear a lot in genomics methods or genomics data analysis i think the reason is that people want people want to do prediction and a lot of people use machine learning as the word to mean prediction mm -hmm. yeah so but, not even yeah. like model fitting but it's like it's model it's models and whatever you're developing specifically for the purpose of prediction exactly yeah and and you can see that many people don't call clustering as machine learning even though we know clustering is unsupervised learning right well prediction is supervised learning but i feel like machine learning was more used narrowly just to mean prediction especially prediction by a complicated model like neural network that's the most common use i see it in the genomics field yeah and also a trend i can see is that more and more people just jump into neural networks when they want to predict something without justifying the necessity. And I see that as a problem. I think in a lot of cases, and also there are a very good talk I heard from Cynthia Rudin from Duke. She's a computer scientist, but I think the talk is very illuminating. She said that based on her abundant experience with data analysis, she didn't see a case with structured data. By structured data means that the data is already tabular. So every feature has numerical values, right? So it's like a matrix-like data. So the data we, we are, it's the most easiest type of data to deal with. And Cynthia said that in her experience, those type of data, for those data, you can always find a simpler interpretable model to do prediction. You don't have to rely on neural network for its prediction accuracy, right? Because the data is already structured in some way. You just need to play smart 
maybe find some good transformation and try to add some useful feature interactions into your simpler model. By simpler interpretable model, she mean regression model and tree-like model. So these are interpretable. And she also acknowledged the power of neural networks for unstructured raw data, for example, images or like voices, right? Those data are not really turned into numerical values and you don't actually know where, what the features are. So in this case, neural networks is a very powerful way for you to extract features from those raw data. But the story is different from structured data. I just feel like in genomics, that distinction was not emphasized enough and many people use neural networks just to start with without thinking about the simpler models, it's just because it looks fancy and it's easier to get their paper published in journals with the the you know the buzzword deep learning. Yeah, actually, uh, when as you yeah. mentioned, it reminded me, I think it was on Medium that a um, yeah. an article popped up that I actually, you know, what, you might have been the one who shared it. You might have shared it on LinkedIn or something like that. And I just picked it up off of you where it was. Oh. Um, I think the title was something like um, neural nets are not ideal for tabular data um and and uh someone so it was someone in my network who shared it and um it's it's been on my um a, a link to it has been and i've been meaning to read it but yeah um and in really that person i think they just said like neural nets aren't for a variety of uh, reasons neural nets are not good for this and then i think they just used it to like try to like squeeze in uh some type of like gradient boosting or something like that um which is, I guess, funny in its own right. It's like, uh, it's like super popular uh, fancy method is not good for this type of data. Let's squeeze in the other one that everyone likes to uh, use. Um, but yeah, no, it, it is a good one. It was actually, um, when you mentioned that, that's actually a conversation that I was wanting to have uh, record. So um, if people enjoy that uh, or think that's interesting, we I'll be trying my best to have an, an episode on that uh, exact topic later. But you've brought up an interesting question, which is the immediate jump to the fanciest model. And yeah, I think there are several aspects of this one that people tried to conflate the sophistication with of their model with the sophistication of their own thought process, their own scientific yeah. thought process. It's like, if I have a super sophisticated model, then I must be doing some type of sophisticated scientific work. Um, and that's unfortunate because it's also generally paired with this idea that they want to use methods that they don't actually have to like have strong hypotheses about how the data interact and things like that. And so people might be like, um, and we've heard this about like from random forests too and things like that, where people are you know, describing that it was a it was a great feature. It's like, oh, I don't have to think about my feature selection or anything like that. It just sort of figures it out all automatically. And that's one, it's a problem because it might not be that effective in many cases. So just like empirically, it might not be that great. Secondly, it it takes someone who's meant to be a scientist testing yeah. hypotheses and it's turning them into someone who's saying like, oh, the greatest feature of this is that I don't actually have to have any strong hypotheses. And then it's no surprise that, for example, when you're talking about oh, machine learning, that people are talking about machine learning for prediction tasks as opposed to like discovery tasks, which I think is one of the great places where machine learning can be used um, for the scientific discovery process. Uh, and so it was actually one of the things I was going to bring up that is it's a shame that in so many fields, people aren't, a section of people are not thinking that machine learning and scientific discovery are a thing that go hand in hand. And that I think that's a problem when you're, when you're trying to do a prediction task, surely a prediction task that has discovered something will be more apt than one that is fairly agnostic to how these things like interoperate and the, the dynamics between them. Uh, maybe that's a little bit of a rant, but I think it is definitely a worthwhile, uh, to the extent that there's a large number of early career uh, data scientists and statisticians who listen. And you might be tempted to say, oh, I'm just going to throw everything into a neural net and call it a day. And that's what's going to make me stand out. I'm afraid that like in most cases it won't, like unless you're working in computer vision or something with a very good use case for those, yeah, you're much better off taking the more gradual layered approach where you just build layer upon layer. Um, I think it was, uh, I think it was Zeno, the, um, the, the, uh, founder of the stoicism, I believe who said, uh, some, something like, uh, that, um, like basically small acts 
like small acts are not great, but they can lead to great things. And so basically when a lot of these people are so eager to distinguish themselves quick in their field, they forget to do all those small things that actually build up a depth of knowledge from which you can have great conversations like these. I mean, like I, I've, I've always enjoyed your observations and I think that has to come from the fact that you've methodically gone through your field. Sorry, I've talked a bit, but uh, what are your thoughts? Thank you. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I'm with you. I, I think that what you said should be what scientists do, right? Not, this, this is not a distinction between computational science and experimental science, because we know for experimental science, rigor and gradual step by step is the key, right? That can only, only doing so can lead you to a reliable discovery. Uh, I think for computational science, because people think, oh, we publish their code, we publish our code, right? So our code should be reproducible. So sort of that believed or claimed transparency give people a place to hide. That's what I think, to hide their actual thought. We think, oh, given you a pipeline, you can run your data. But, you know, all the papers, at least in genomics, right, they rely on, I would say, limited empirical evidence to show a method works well on these three or four data sets, but who knows how it generalizes to more data sets from user's perspective. So, so that's why I feel like methodological or philosophical thinking is still indispensable. We really need to think carefully instead of just showing, oh, see, neural network works so well on these four data sets. <laughs> But how can people train a, bad, a good neural network if they don't use your trained network per se? Because I think in most cases, people cannot just directly apply author's trained model to their new data. They need some new training. But I'm afraid that not so many people are good at training neural networks on their new data if they don't do this, right? And there are so many tuning parameters. I think these are all issues the method developers need to address. And there are several good examples to show that, you know, since genomics is, a, is so prosperous, so many people doing method development for the same task. Let me just give you one example, cell clustering for single cell rna data. So maybe not 50, but I would say still, yeah, probably safe to say 50 methods have been developed for the same task. So therefore benchmarking becomes a set of a necessary thing that people want to have. So people want some third party person to do benchmarking of methods developed for the same purpose and really see which method performs better under which scenario. So in those benchmark, we often see that interestingly, the simplest or the classic method performs the best. <laughs> so I think that itself says something about method development, or we, we cannot just develop new methods purely for publications because getting a paper published and having an impactful method are actually two different things. Yeah. And yeah. frequently it's not just that they are two different things. They're frequently competing things. Competing, yeah, um, competing things. Yeah, it's like, I mean, not not to sound like a jerk, but like sometimes, you know, like, for example, the scientific review process, it's not like, you know, the idea is like, it's peer review. But the the fact is, like, if you have really good ideas, your peers might not be reviewing you. Like, it might be just the most, like, <laughs> obtuse postdoc of the most prestigious professor in your field. It's like, you know, the 50-year the postdoc. And it's like, that's the person who's going to be reviewing your paper. And it's like, and if you go in and you're trying to go through ideas, um... Well, the, the first line of attack might just be, well, this isn't methodologically new enough um, to warrant a, a, as if the only thing, as if the only aspect of scientific discovery is in our field is just new methods. And it isn't. Um, yeah. 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 Um, no. it, it, it is. Um, tr the, sorry. I, I was about to go into a rant about sometimes like I actually wrote a paper once where it's like, I really just want to like hammer in like this like a specific idea like if we basically take this general type of approach we have all these nice things and there's i really got into the, sort of the science behind why methods of this nature would be good and like i use a simple method so it was clear and you don't lose anybody and then they look at that and like oh but you use a simple method and it's like yeah they're, they're like that's the point so that we don't lose people on the idea um anyway go on, go on what were you gonna say that, that that's exactly what i think I, so i 
probably it's also something philosophical. So if people can address or solve an important problem using a simple tool, would you think that is good, right? I personally think that's good because solving the problem is the is the key, right? That's the primary goal of the project. But I do see people in our field or in computer science as well. So computational people, some people might criticize this for, for example, in the grant application for lacking of novelty in the approach. So, so I think that is also a reason why people just to secure or grant a proposal writers, right? A PIs, principal investigators, when they submit proposals, they want to appeal to most reviewers by showing that we don't, we not only have an interesting problem to address, we also have fancy new methods to develop. At least from the grantsmanship perspective, it will make your proposal more attractive. I can see that and I can see why review some, why, why people want to do that to appease reviewers. But I just want to say that computational methods, they are tools, right? So they need to find their correct targets to be powerful. We shouldn't, and I told some journal editors as well, we should never rank methods by complication, by saying, okay, complicated methods are better than simple methods. I think that perspective itself should be dropped. Yeah. Um... Actually, on that, on your previous note, when you're talking about saying it's like, oh, if you have a simpler method, it's just as good uh, or better because the only thing that matters is you solving the problem. I'd actually say I'd go farther with that and say <clears throat> there's actually reasons why you would want to use simpler methods, which is the fact that there's so much, you know, we talk about black box in forms like interpretability yep. and things like that, but there's so yeah. much black box when you go from, you know, the data, um, you have the raw data, you curate it, you clean it. Uh, you have the, you, you have your model selection, you have your inference over that model, you have the right re regularization of said inference. Uh, once it spits it out on the other end, typically you'll have another post-processing step or something like that. And so you'll have this long pipeline and the more complex your model, the more you might misunderstand what your model is actually doing. Like it's harder to debug these things. And so it, it's not trivial. It's not trivial to debug like a fairly complex linear regression model. You can get there a lot faster than trying to debug, say, for example, like a multitask Gaussian process or yeah. a neural net. Um, I was going to say something or like a random force, but I, I wouldn't even know how to start on one of those. But, you know, just the idea is like there's so much that can go wrong and not can does go wrong. Like you're guaranteed to have things go wrong. And so the idea that you're going to have a model that you don't understand is to make it harder to debug. Um, which means that you're less likely to actually be saying something real. Um, yep. and I agree. Yep. there's one other bit, sorry, I, I was trying to think there's one other thing that you reminded me of, um, but not uh, flew the coop. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think so. So that's why, you know, in people know stuff. All carbs, uh, all, all, all razor, all comes razor, right? So that's something people talk about regarding simplicity and sparsity right whenever you don't have you don't have a unique answer people also always prefer the simple answer that are equal equally good as a complicated answer i think that's the mindset we had in ancient times but nowadays many people i still think the publication drive is the key that's behind all these things people want to get papers out <laughs> Yeah, actually, oh, yeah. you you reminded me. You reminded me when you said cutting. Uh, said something about like cutting corners. Um, or yeah. cut, you talked about cutting an Occam's razor and around exactly yeah. what the next point I was to make is yeah. on the issue of cutting corners, where basically, when people aren't wanting to have hypothesis-driven models and things like that, um, they're cutting a corner. They're cutting an intellectual corner. You know, they're saying, okay, we previously had this thing where we developed hypotheses about the nature of the data or the nature of the mechanism, and then we collect the data in order to examine that inner relationship and then go forward so on and so forth trust me i know the next steps probably uh, but you you get the idea it's like they're cutting that initial corner um by saying we aren't going to talk about hypotheses it's like well that mindset of cutting corners well what's the next corner that you're going to cut it's like well the model fits and it gives me an output so i bet it's probably fitting the right thing so there's another corner cut and then it's mm -hmm. like well um you know you you can keep adding these cut corners um, it's like, well, the model hasn't produced an error, therefore it must be right. 
which is basically how most people deal with all, not most, sorry, a portion of people deal with these like open source machine learning and data science libraries where they just like, the model hasn't given me an error, it must be right. So like they aren't looking at any of the tuning parameters, they don't learn much about the model. Uh, another corner to cut, I don't know anything about the mathematics of the model because I didn't have to program it. Uh, you know, things like that. And I'm not even talking about theoretical math, the like the deep theory about like convergence rates or anything. I'm just talking about like how the model turns like A into B and input and output. Yeah. Yeah. And so and you, people keep cutting corners and cutting corners and cutting corners. And then it's no surprise that we have so many technical professionals who model, like your model doesn't really tell us anything. It's not scientific. It can't be used very much. Um, if at all, it's probably wrong. Um, and at the most you can say to it is that just by some random chance, one of these mini bad models happened to have like exceptionally good performance. Um, but at that point, it's like, you know, um, I, I guess it's sort of like multiple hypothesis testing. Like um, you, you take all these models and you say, well, sure, some of these have really good performance, but do they actually mean anything by purposely? Or is it just random chance that if you have, you know, uh, 20,000 undergrads throw their model at it, some of them will have high performance regardless of the, if they put anything in it. Um, yep. And that is an actual problem where like I, I've talked to some people uh, who did like data competitions and they were talking with uh, some of the like highest success uh, competitors in it and found like an immense number of errors. And th this is a common story amongst many people who have done these things. Like they talk to the people who won and like the models don't make any sense. And so it's just like, uh, however this person won, it is not actually because they're good. They just, they could just as randomly been the person at the bottom 10% as they would have been at the top 10% or whatever. Um, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, long rant, but I do appreciate you did remind me of, of, of that point on cutting corners, but, um, yeah, I'll, I'll let you, I'll let you have the last word and then I'll have one final question after this. Um, yeah. but yeah. Thank you. So I think my last word is that people need to think more carefully about the computational approach, especially the statistical inference, if they do it, whether it is something that that's quest that, that can be questioned and checked. Mm, yeah, don't be too rushed when you try to get something done, especially statistical analysis. Yeah, the, honestly, the, I think that's like, that's just a perfect piece of advice for science in general. The more you understand the layers upon which your thoughts are built, yeah. the farther you will go. And I don't think that's even, I think it's really, it's super useful for data scientists, statisticians, people, machine learning, because we have so many layers in our sort of decision pipeline. Yeah. Um, and so you really need to be strong on those. And you just also have, I guess, the perseverance and courage to see all these other people like zoom out ahead of you, um, looking like they're making this immense amount of progress and just realize like, oh, don't worry. Like you'll be seeing them in the rear view mirror the moment they hit a local minimum and don't have the intellectual capacity to work themselves out of it. Where if you have this like broad base of knowledge, you will have the ability to work yourself out of these like local ruts in your scientific discovery process. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, that, that, that is great advice. And it's why once again, I, I commend myself for inviting you on because you, know, you, you do have great ideas. Um, Thank you. Yeah. And I was actually, I mean, maybe this is a good time you talk about people need me more people need to be more philosophical. You know, it's like, you know, there is a philosophy of data science series done by the Journal of uh, Data Science. Uh, he's a great editor and things like that. Real smart guy. He has a podcast and everything. And people can hear more of those conversations or read more of those conversations there. Um, so yeah, just, just staying out there in case, in case you've seen any of that. But yeah, so my final question though is, um, what is a debate that you would like to see happen within the statistics community. So where, what is sort of like a, an issue that you would like to see statisticians just like come together and rigorously debate? Very good question. I think from my perspective, I've seen very nice debates right in my career. For example, I think when I was a student, I've seen, I've read uh, the Leo Bryan's paper about the two cultures, right? The, the more machine learning like models that focus more on prediction and more statistical like models that focus more on inference. I've seen that interesting discussion. I think it's still ongoing. And then I've also seen the controversy over p-values, whether we should you continue using it a bit, um, given all the inaccuracies, all the problems here, or we should completely drop it. I think for now, 
one issue I think it's relevant to all the people who want to publish in statistics journals, especially people in academia, is what the, I would say, how do we define good statistical method? Yeah, I think that I've seen discussion in JSMs before, maybe before pandemic, right? And people were talking about these top journals need changes to reflect the broader statistics field nowadays. Like you can not only focus on theory, but also novel methodology. So I think a pressing issue is when a method that seems novel, but doesn't have a well-backed theory, how can we trust it within the statistics community? In what ways do we want to say, yeah, it is something we can publish in our journal instead of asking the author to submit it to some specialized application journals in, of that specific field? That's the first question. And the second question I have is, you know, JASA has a section called applications and cases studies, case studies. So that's that section focuses on application papers. They want to look for an interesting data analysis where the, math, the authors use some statistical approaches to give answers or extract results from that analysis. However, how can JASA, this section, distinguish itself from, like I said, specialized journals in that field? Why don't people submit to those journals? Because if their data analysis is the key, they may want people in that field be aware of their results. Maybe it makes more sense to go that route. So I think these are questions that statistics journal editors need to think about. And also back to your question, what's the debate? I think the debate or the question is what makes a good statistical method? I have to say that like, I wasn't expecting that, but that's a really good answer. Like, um, yeah, no, that, that, that is. And, um, yeah, I think that's a really good answer. <laughs> Honestly, I don't even see any need to comment on that. Like that, 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 that's a really good answer. I, I appreciate that. Um, thank so, you. Yeah. Jingyi, uh, until next time. Yeah. Um, congratulations on your second episode and I <laughs> can't wait until, uh, do we talk to our, for our third. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for hosting me. Hey guys, it's Glenn. Thanks for your time today. I hope you liked today's episode. If you did, please consider smashing that like button. It's the single, simplest, fastest way to make sure that YouTube shows this video to more people. If you really want to go crazy, consider subscribing or going to our website and joining the mail list. If you want to go totally crazy beyond that, forward this to a friend or colleague who you think might enjoy this too. We're a small channel and every bit helps. Our next episode will be coming out next week. So in the meantime, feel free to look around the channel and see other videos that might be of interest. As a quick disclaimer, the views expressed on the show do not represent anything other than the people saying those words, views, et cetera, like that. It doesn't mean anything about their employers or their employer's views or some thing about their employers or their neighbor's cat or anyone else not saying the words. And in fact, given that people tend to change their views when they're thoughtful enough, it might not even represent the views of the speaker by the time you're hearing the episode. So definitely come back and see if they've changed their views at a later date. They also don't represent the views of our sponsors. Thank you to our sponsors. You can check them out on our website.